Hello, everybody. Um, my name is Juho Nurminen, and I'm here to talk to you about web attacks against antivirus software, or how I hacked F-Secure for the nth time using only a browser. <laughs> and this is a very interesting event to be giving this talk, because well, F-Secure is one of, the, one of the sponsors, obviously, but uh, also probably half of the audience is from F-Secure as well. So I'll be interested to hear your comments after this. <laughs> um, a quick introduction a little bit about myself. Um, I am a lot of things. I'm mainly a hacker. I've been doing offensive security professionally for about three years. Uh, I work at a company called Second Nature Security, which you may or may not have heard of. I'm, I've been doing bug bounties for a very long time. I started around 2010, 2011, uh, which is, uh, that would make it about seven or eight years and that's longer than, for example, uh, HackerOne has existed. So I would say that's fairly long uh, time to be uh, have, having been done bug bounties. I've done easily more than 10 different bug bounty programs and found who knows how many vulnerabilities. Uh, you may also recognize me uh, from Twitter from an incident where I happened to post Adobe's private PGP key online when they had accidentally uploaded, on, uploaded it on their website. That was an interesting one, and uh, fun was had by all, especially Adobe. I have a bunch of CVEs in my name, um, uh, mostly browsers, some web applications, Chrome, Firefox, uh, uh, Drupal, WebKit, and uh, WebKit obviously is in Apple software and everywhere. Uh, this is uh, most likely not an exhaustive list. I'm, I'm definitely forgetting something. And there's definitely more on the way, so keep a lookout for those. Anyway, uh, this talk is about antivirus software. And so you might be wo wondering where are all the antivirus CVEs? Well, there aren't any, but I've done the Avast bug bounty program, and I've done, I've done the F-Secure bug bounty program. Avast doesn't uh, even issue advisories for vulnerabilities that they fix. F-Secure does, but they don't request for CVEs. So no CVEs, but advisories. There you can see uh, all the advisories that F-Secure has published in the past two years, so 2016, 2017. And there are six advisories. Out of those six advisories, three, uh, three are mine. So half of everything F-Secure has uh, fixed in the past two years. Uh, only F-Secure doesn't actually issue advisories for everything they fix. Just I don't know how they pick the ones they issue advisories for. But anyway. Outside of the ones they've published, there's this stuff, which is uh, UXSSs on UXSSs on two different platforms: information leak on F-Secure Safe for Windows, uh, markup injections on Android, a uh, couple of different bypasses in different software. Uh, I was uh, originally planning to talk to you today about two different vulnerabilities. Uh, the two. Uh, in that, that list that are from last year, so 2017. But uh, it turns out 50 minutes is nowhere near enough to talk to you about two vulnerabilities uh, when I wanted to maintain a certain level of technical detail. So I will only be talking to you about one of them, and I chose to keep the more interesting one, which is universal cross-site scripting on F-Secure Safe for Windows. Um, 
I'm uh, sort of hoping that almost everyone in the audience knows what cross-site scripting is. But uh, what I would like to, like to know is uh, how many of you know what uh, universal cross-site scripting is? Could I get a hands up, a show of hands? How many of you know what universal cross-site scripting is? That's like five people, and uh, sort of what I was assuming. So uh, cross-site scripting, everyone's familiar with that. It's, it's a web application vulnerability where essentially um, for some reason, usually something related to input validation or output encoding or escaping, for whatever reason, you're able to inject JavaScript code into the, uh, into the UI of a web application. And when you're able to inject JavaScript code into the UI of a web application, that's a bad thing because then you're able to read everything in the UI of the web application, which means all the user's data. Universal cross-site scripting is a bit different, but the same. Um, it's the same in the sense that uh, the end result is the same. You're able to inject JavaScript code into the user interface of a web application. But uh, the scope and the scale of things is completely different. Instead of being able to inject JavaScript code into the uh, user interface of a single web application, you're able to inject it everywhere, to every single website on the internet for that single user. In fact, universal cross-site scripting is not a web application vulnerability at all. It's, uh, uh, the vulnerability is in a completely different part of the software stack. It's actually not uh, on the end of the web application, uh, sort of. It's, it's in your client, and it's a client vulnerability. So um, uh, you could have a universal cross-site scripting, for example, in your browser software, uh, Google Chrome, Mozilla Firefox, Microsoft Edge, they could have a universal cross-site scripting vulnerability. Or you could have a universal cross-site scripting, uh, cross scripting vulnerability in your operating system or your router, maybe, or your network stack somewhere. Essentially, the idea is that something on the client's end, in the client software, goes wrong and somehow you're able to bypass this, uh, these uh, same origin policies and whatever and inject code into web applications you're not supposed to have access to. Um, a li little bit about the targeted application. F-Secure Safe, it's uh, a product that probably most of you are, fam are, fam are familiar with. It's sort of the, the main consumer product from F-Secure, a traditional antivirus product with some extra features like browsing protection and banking protection, parental controls. Uh, it's a simple to understand product, not, not necessarily a simple product technically, but, uh, but simple to understand because it's sort of an everyday product, a consumer antivirus product that's nothing sort of, nothing special in the sense of, uh, where, where antiviruses go. Anyway, these extra features, browsing protection. Uh, browsing protection is essentially a filter for your web traffic. It will uh, look at all the URLs you have, all the URLs you try to visit in your web browser. And um, it will uh, tag all the websites with some tag, for example, this website is malicious, this website is safe, or something based on the content. For example, this website is social media content or, or news content, or this is an adult website. And whenever it encounter, encounters a malicious website, it will not let you visit it. It will instead show you a block page, a sort of warning that uh, this is bad, this is a bad thing you tried to visit, don't go there. Um, most antivirus products, at least consumer antivirus products, implement something like this. And uh, so this is not an unusual thing. But what's uh, slightly unusual is uh, that uh, this feature in F-Secure Safe does not 
uh, do man-in-the-middle attacks on your HTTPS traffic. Um, that's something that many competi competi uh, competing products do. So um, uh, competing products might decrypt your HTTPS traffic outside the browser and issue their own TLS certificate. And the browser will only see the TLS certificate of the antivirus product instead of the TLS certificate of the original website. And that's sort of a bad thing because that means um, you're taking essentially TLS certificate validation away from the browser. And uh, browser, vendors, browser vendors have spent a lot of time and effort and money on making TLS certificate validation secure. Any antivirus product vendor is never going to be able to match the level of uh, security in TLS certificate validation with the browser vendors. So don't do that. And F-Secure Safe is not doing that. That's good news. Anyway, moving on to the next feature, banking protection, parental controls. Uh, those are essentially the same as browsing protection. Um, the only sort of difference is it's, it's the same technology, but it's applied to a different use case. So uh, instead of blocking malicious websites, banking protection uh, works when you uh, visit your online bank. It will activate and it will block access to all other websites other than your online bank. Uh, this is in order to, I guess, uh, minimize the attack surface, uh, block malicious websites from accessing your online bank, and block phishing attempts. Uh, parental controls, uh, well, it's sort of self-evident. Uh, they allow uh, parents to block uh, unwanted content from their children. There's uh, some uh, practical problems when it comes to implementing a feature like browsing protection. Um, the major one being what I was just talking about, which is uh, doing HTTPS man-in-the-middle attacks, or rather uh, figuring out how to implement this feature without having to do HTTPS man-in-the-middle attacks. So how do you do something like this when you have to access the URL of all websites the user visits but you don't want to issue your own TLS certificates and break everything in the certificate, vali certificate validation chain. Um, F-Secure has solved this in a wonderful way. They have solved this in the best way possible, at least as far as I can think of. So F-Secure is using a browser extension. That is a perfect solution for, solution for this. Using a browser extension allows you to uh, uh, do the network interception inside the browser before any outgoing traffic gets encrypted and after any incoming uh, traffic has been already uh, de decrypted. So you get to work with plain text uh, traffic all the time and don't have to care about HTTPS. Now, another problem that's sort of caused by this one is that when you use a browser extension as part of your uh, antivirus, products, we, antivirus product, which is es essentially a native application, you have to somehow uh, communicate between the two. So how do you implement communication between a anti uh, native antivirus product and the browser extension? So um, uh, there has to be some com communication in, or in order the in order for the extension to access the tagging, fu tagging functionality, it has to somehow know what these web websites are that uh, the user is visiting. It has to query the backend for this information. And again, F-Secure is doing a wonderful job. They're doing the right thing. They're using native messaging. This is a Chrome API that allows, essentially, allows browser extensions to pass messages to native applications using uh, serialized JSON and standard input and output. So it's very secure. 
nothing enters the network. Everything goes locally using STDIO. Um, the next thing is, uh, well, this is a sort of a problem that I have to imagine every software vendor runs into at some point. And it's a silly, silly problem to have, but I, I can't imagine any other reason for sort of these decisions that FCQ has made. The problem is we had two problems. We've solved them both. Now we have software that's way too secure. We'll, uh, uh, everyone, ev everyone in the security community will be out of a job because we have too secure software. So how can we screw this up? How can we, how can we make this terrible again? And the solution is to essentially reverse the previous two things. Uh, for example, since we are already using a browser extension, we'll just du duplicate that feature in the back end and uh, implement, re-implement the feature, the in network interception feature in the back end. Uh, do it twice, which is a bad thing because, well, you're doubling the attack surface for the number of features visible to the end user. And you're also, um, <clears throat> um, uh, you're also implementing the exactly same feature twice, which means you will end up with weird interactions between the two implementations, especially when the both implementations are interacting with the same network traffic. Second thing, even though we're using native messaging, we'll still expose a bunch of web APIs. We'll still do most of the communication using web APIs that are exposed on local hosts. So we'll just use native messaging for passing around some authentication token or whatever, and then do everything else on the web, which is silly, because you could actually do everything using native messaging. Anyway, now that we know a little bit about the uh, uh, theoretical implement implementation of this, uh, this software. Let's look at it in practice and uh, look at the act attack surface a bit. So this is a screenshot of the blog page. When you try to visit a malicious website, this is what you'll see. Uh, you can see in the URL bar I've tried to visit malware.ycar.org, which is a website that hosts browser exploits. So it won't let me visit that website. Instead, it will show me this warning. Uh, the URL bar shows the original URL. Uh, the content also reflects the original URL. And then there's a button to uh, allow, make an exception, allow this website, whitelist this website. Uh, the shield icon on the button means that clicking on the button will trigger UAC. So Windows UAC, which uh, definitely requires user interaction, it might require you to enter an administrator's password. So that's a thing that's not easy to bypass. Next slide, almost identical to the previous slide. The only difference is are the URL bar. Now the URL is different. It's localhost something, but you can still see the original URL in the body. So the difference compared to the previous one is that this is an HTTPS page. It's the same website, but this time I tried to access it over HTTPS. And now FSecure Safe can't make, uh, or can't do the network interception in the back end. Instead, it has to use the browser extension. And the browser extension is not able to replace the content in place, so it has to instead redirect to a new page that's, ser that's served from localhost. So that's the only difference. Otherwise, the page is the same. But you can see that the, uh, the block page has a URL. And if you know this URL, you can access this block page right directly, just link to it. Anyway, moving forward, looking more at the attack surfaces, this is another feature of, feature of browsing protection. Whenever you uh, do a Google search, uh, do a search on whatever search engine, you will see 
this, this is Google search results, but there's something extra. There's green check marks injected to the content. And this is injected by F-Secure Safe. So from this, we know that F-Secure Safe is somehow communicating with this web page, which means this is another att attack surface. This web page is somehow able to access F-Secure Safe's backend APIs. And finally, this is uh, the DevTools view of the background page of the extension. <coughs> so um, here you can see uh, what the extension does in the background and what HTTP requests it's making. So in this case, when we try to visit a malicious website over HTTPS, in the background it's making this HTTP call to a localhost API. It's issuing this host request where it asks for the backend to do an HTTPS scan. And as the payload, it's uh, sending this URL of the malicious page or whatever web page. Whenever we visit a new page over HTTPS, it will send it to the backend and ask it, is this safe to visit? And as a response, when this was a malicious page, it will tell you to redirect to a block page. <clears throat> now, getting to actually exploiting some features in this browsing protection feature. <clears throat> um, this is uh, the source code of a block page. This is the HTTP version. You can see the original URL in the URL bar. But it doesn't matter which version this is because they're both the same. The source code of this, the HTML source code of this page is the same for both HTTP and HTTPS. But what's interesting in this piece of script that we're seeing here is this. This is an assignment to location.href. And it's an assignment where the uh, value is coming from user input. That is the original URL we tried to visit, which means it's coming from the user. And it's, be it's being assigned to location.href, which is an unsafe API, assigning uh, a badly formatted URL to it might lead to JavaScript execution. If you assign a JavaScript URI to it, you will execute JavaScript. So this is a potential uh, uh, point of attack for XSS. Now, it looks like this might not be exploitable because the content that's reflected from the user, user input also in includes the URI scheme, which is HTTP. So we would have to somehow get rid of that HTTP and instead replace it with JavaScript to be able to execute JavaScript. And then there's another problem. This function where this assignment is being done is only called once you click, click the Allow uh, Website button, which triggers UAC. So it's, it's a terrible amount of user interaction that would be required for this to execute. So no luck there. We need more bugs. We need something else. Turns out. It turns out that the API that the background page is using to redirect to new block pages, it allows generating sort of impossible block pages, block pages for URI, URIs that would never access the network and so should never be seen actually by F-Secure Safe. So if you simply uh, take this HTTP request and replace this part with JavaScript, you will end up with a block page that actually contains a JavaScript URI uh, in the assignment to location.href. The uh, unfortunate part here is that accessing this API requires you to know an authentication token. So you essentially can't access it unless you already have code execution on the, uh, on the background page, which in itself would already be bad. So it doesn't look like this, might, this would be exploitable either. 
we need more bugs. How do we access the API? Well, we already know that uh, FSecure is somehow communicating with all search results pages. Whenever you do a Google search, it's, it's somehow communicating with this page that displays the results. And what we know about this page is that it's uh, served over HTTPS, which means that uh, FSecure Safe can't be doing any any sort of interception in the background page. Uh, 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 sorry, uh, in the in the backend of the of the uh, antivirus software. Instead, it has to be using the extension. And so that raises the question: If we were to access this. Uh, search results page using unencrypted HTTP, would we see a different result? Is there a separate implementation of this feature for HTTP like there is for block pages? Um, that's an interesting thought, but there's a problem with that, uh, a problem with testing that in practice, because um, all the modern search engines are these days HTTPS only. So you can't just go to an HTTP version of a search results page and test how it works. There are no HTTP versions of uh, modern search engines. Even Bing is HTTPS only these days, which is sort of surprising. But instead, we can, we can just go with the assumption that there has to exist an HTTP version of this feature a separate implementation for HTTP, and then look at what the next step would be in this exploit chain. And the obvious next step would be looking at how does FSecure Safe know what pages on the web are search results? How would it know that this is a search results page when it has really nothing to go by? Uh, Google.com could be hosting any number of different types of content. So how does it know that this is actually search results and not, not for example, uh, a, a login page or whatever documentation page or, or whatever Google might be hosting? How does it know uh, which pages it has to inject this content into? Well, to find out, we have to step outside the browser for just a moment. We'll step into PowerShell and use strings on the on the backend implementation of FSecure Safe. We'll use strings and look for something very specific, which is regular expressions, and particularly regular expressions that contain literal dots, because regular expressions that contain literal dots would be ones that anyone would possibly use for matching URLs. URLs generally, at least once for accessing internet would always contain uh, literal dots. And this is what we get. We get a bunch of results. There's something that indeed looks like it would match search results pages. There's Google, there's Yahoo, there's actually three different Yahoos. There's Bing, there's YouTube. But there's one that stands out, and it's this one. It's safesearch.fsecure.com. And it stands out for two reasons. Um, first of all, it's not a search result. Uh, it's not a, a commonly used search engine. It's something that FSecure implemented themselves. And it's also uh, the regular expression used for matching this URL is much more permissive than any of the other ones we saw in the results. This one actually contains backslash s and star in the domain name which means we can enter anything into the domain name. For example, this one matches this URL, which is search.evil.example. That's, that, that's definitely not a search engine I've ever heard of, so that would be a bad thing. So, so all we have to do is exp, uh, upload our proof of concept exploits to this URL, and we should see something interesting. What we see is this. This is a screenshot of the actual uh, final completed exploit proof of concept. But what I want you to point your attention to at this point is 
these two URLs, these are injected by F-Secure Safe. Uh, there's a script tag uh, containing a rating script, and then there's a, a link tag pointing to a style sheet, CSS file that contains some styling information. But both of those URLs contain the secret API token we were looking for. So using this evil URL, we can access the API tokens, and then we can access the API located on localhost. So uh, going back to the JavaScript execution, we now have what we need to inject JavaScript into the content. We have location href, and we can assign a JavaScript URL to it, or URI, rather. Uh, one problem remains. Uh, this assignment is still only done after some heavy amount of user interaction. The user has to click on allow this website and has to go through Windows UAC. And they may have to enter their admin pass password. And to get past that, you would need some serious uh, social engineering skills to actually be able to tell someone to enter your admin, admin password when they're seeing a page that says, you tried to visit a malicious website. Don't go here. So we still need more bugs. <clears throat> now, this is where it gets slightly complicated. Um, the interested, interesting part here is this handle response function. And it, get, it gets called from here, which is an on ready state change listener. This on ready state change listener gets triggered by this post requests, request, which is an API call. It has a dynami dynamic part in the URL, the value part, which is coming from here. And in fact, it's not dynamic at all. It's, uh, it's this static string here, action ID equals check allow refresh. And so uh, here we can see that this uh, trigger function is getting called every two seconds. It's on a timer, and it's getting called every two seconds. So the block page is polling this API that's actually on our evil domain. Uh, F-Secure Safe is intercepting this HTTP request to our evil domain, and it's not letting the HTTP request go to the network at all. It's instead responding from localhost to this HTTP request. And letting the block page know whether or not it should allow redirection to the malicious page, whether or not the user has clicked on the, check, uh, on the allow this website button. So um, how do we prevent uh, F-Secure Safe backend from intercepting this HTTP request? How can we somehow force this request go, to go to all the way to our server and so that we are able to respond to this HTTP request ourselves and tell the block page to go forward and, and execute our JavaScript payload? Well, there's a surprising, surprising solution, because it's a, it's a browser security feature. Uh, the solution is HTTP strict transport security. By triggering HTTP strict transport security, you can force this HTTP call to go over HTTPS. And in that, in, uh, when that happens, F-Secure Safe is no longer able to in in intercept the call uh, because it doesn't do any HTTPS man in the middle attacks. So the call goes all the way to the server, and the server can respond to the API call in any way it likes. It can tell this page that it's OK to go to the malicious page. And then when this page tries to redirect to the malicious, malicious page, it will instead execute a JavaScript payload. So looking at the JavaScript ex execution, we solved both problems. We have JavaScript execution. We don't need any more bugs. We can start exploiting. So demo time. So this is a very, very, very bare, bone, bare bones demo. 
it's not meant to be fancy. It's meant to be sort of simple so that you can actually see what's happening. And when, uh, if you can see the URL, I'm not sure if you can see it, but it's uh, the, UR, the malicious URL we just crafted. So it's search.evil.example slash dot fsecure.com slash poc dot html question mark search question mark, question mark. So this matches the regular expression we found using strings. Now, when we click on hack me, it will open a malicious blog page. And in the content, you can see the malicious payload. And in the background, it's making a timing attack with uh, HSTS and forcing uh, HSTS to go using uh, cross-origin resource sharing to our domain and triggering the JavaScript payload. Now, now we just, just gained JavaScript execution on example.com, but this is sort of a silly demo because it doesn't really do anything useful. I have something much nicer here, which I hope this works because uh, it might not. Uh, this is a much more, much more sort of, uh, this is something you might actually fall for. This is a mock-up of a, a web store and the checkout page of that web store. It loads payment methods. And I might have to reload the page because there's some interaction with the previous exploit. So it doesn't work for the first time every time. Um, it loads payment methods. And if it still doesn't work, I have to. Yes, now it works. So it loads the payment methods. Once those are loaded, I click on my bank. I go to the payment page. It opens my payment page. It's a valid payment page from OP. I enter my credentials. Don't use these. These are my real banking credentials. <laughs> oh, crap. I just told you my password. This is bad. Uh, obligatory slide on disclosure and patch and the timeline. I reported this to FSecure in September. Uh, patch came out in uh, November, and an advisory was issued in, in December. Uh, everything on FSecure's end went perfectly. They handled the disclosure very, we very well, so I have no, no sort of bad things to say about that. FSecure handled everything really, really, really well. A um, couple of interesting things about the advisory. Uh, FSecure Safe is not the only product that's affected. This also affects one of their enterprise product products, which is PSP computer protection. Um, another thing, uh, the, uh, the advisory mentions as a mitigating factor that HTTPS connections are not vulnerable. That's, uh, strictly speaking, true. Uh, you can't inject JavaScript content into HTTPS pages. But that doesn't mean you can't exploit this against HTTPS websites. Because uh, what you just saw was me exploiting this against Osuspanki or OP, wh whatever. Uh, they definitely have a HTTPS website, so that shouldn't be possible. Only I wasn't exploiting it against the HTTPS website. I was exploiting it against HTTP, where they have no website, but I generated the website dynamically on the fly. So uh, it was essentially a sophisticated phishing attack using this exploit as a base. But that's not, only th that's not the only thing you can do against HTTPS. Uh, you can ac actually steal data from HTTPS websites if the HTTPS website doesn't have uh, the secure and HTTP only cookie flags set, because in that case, you can just make requests to the HTTP version of the website and read the cookies using that. So 
HTTPS websites are still definitely vulnerable to this attack, but HTTPS connections themselves are not. FCKR uh, rewarded, rewarded me with 750 euros for this. It's, I think, a fair, fair amount uh, considering the difficulty of the exploitation. There's some timing attacks involved and very much complexity. So, uh, A few takeaways. Um, first of all, antivirus software, security software in general, huge attack surfaces. I'm not a big fan of running antivirus software on my computers. I run, I run Windows Defender, and that's all I'm willing to run. So third-party third party antivirus software, not necessarily the best idea. But maybe if you're a sort of uh, non-security conscious user, you might benefit from it. <clears throat> anyway, the reason why antivirus software uh, is sort of uh, vulnerable to these same issues that every other software is, is because antivirus software companies are essentially software companies. They are not security companies in the sense that they don't necessarily make their products any more secure. They have the all, all the same constraint as ev constraints as every other software company. They have all the other, uh, all the uh, same uh, sort of uh, business pressure as all, all the other companies. So some company being a security company in name doesn't necessarily mean they make more secure products. Another takeaway uh, is that uh, the distinction between desktop, desktop and web is not necessarily as meaningful as you might assume it to be. There's definitely a distinction. You, you can always tell whether something is a desktop software or, or a web software. But uh, the thing is, uh, web is sort of everywhere, and a lot of desktop software these days is using web technologies. Even if they're not exposing APIs on local host, they might be using uh, HTML for their user interface. They might be embedding a browser in the user, user interface. They might be doing all sorts of silly things. Um, so don't restrict your approach. When you're looking at desktop software, don't just stick to the desktop techniques. Uh, when you see HTML, try if you can get XSS on that. And whatever else you can come up with. Uh, one more point, minor bugs. When, when there's enough of them and you chain them together, they can be quite nasty, so don't ignore them. Fix them when you see them. None of these bugs that I showed you here were exploitable in any way on their own. Not in any way. You couldn't have done anything that had a security impact on a single bug with, uh, from this presentation. But when you chain all of them together, you gain universal access. And for the developers, if you do with your product something that's uh, uh, not designed to be done, uh, even the security features will turn on you. So if the developer or designer of a, a particular security uh, feature can't have predicted you to be doing something silly, like uh, injecting yourself to uh, the path, net network path and and replacing content and, and doing silly things there and exposing a bunch of APIs, the security features will turn on you and they will have a negative impact. Or they just might stop working, whatever. That's it. Uh, I have some time for questions and comments, so go ahead and shoot. Any questions? There's one, yeah. 
Yeah, thanks for the great talk. Uh, I was wondering how, how do you choose your targets? Uh, because I see you have like a lot of skills in the web, like a, in, in the browser space. Yeah. Uh, is, is that the driving factor? Or? Um, I was talking with someone here earlier about the same thing. And the way I like to choose my targets for, for bug bounties or whatever, um, I like to look at software I already know for some reason. For, for example, F-Secure Safe, I've, done, I, I've reported multiple issues in it before. So this wasn't the first time I was looking at F-Secure Safe. And also, uh, F-Secure Safe is not an example of this, but I also like to look at uh, software that no one else has looked at before. So I try to pick, uh, I try to pick sort of obscure software that might not have gotten the attention it, it sort of warrants. Yeah, thank you. Uh, because like, um, even, even, even though um, it works as a browser extension, so, so it pretty much has like uh, uh, really big impacts, uh, I would figure that uh, like a security software wouldn't be the most obvious <laughs> uh, thing to look at. Yeah. Thanks. Anyone else? Questions, comments, anything? Hey, yeah. I have a question. Do you think the bug bounty should be bigger? 750 euros for that amount of work. <clears throat> well, uh, it looks like a lot of work. Yeah. In reality, it was one evening. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, yeah, it's like. <laughs> OK. Considering that, it's not bad. So you were drunk. Having beer, <laughs> testing things out. Yeah, yeah. OK. But also, uh, I'm not really sure what uh, the bug bounty program should be uh, deciding their bounties on, wh uh, what basis. But uh, it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't necessarily make sense to uh, just give you rewards for clever things and, and and uh, interesting exploits. It makes more sense to uh, reward people based on the business impact. And this one is really difficult to exploit. It requires a timing attack. It requires customization for each different browser. So it's, it's really difficult to exploit. That that's, does explain some of it. Many browser extensions inject some code to the web page they're working with. Uh, now with the modifications to the Firefox Quantum, also Firefox plugins have to be modified to work that way. Do you think that there is general attack surface against plugins that inject their code to the web page to talk with the privileged part? There's much less of it than before. Firefox Quantum is much better than the previous, whatever they had. Um, uh, browser extension, uh, the web extension APIs that they're using in, in uh, Firefox Quantum, um, they implement uh, context isolation between uh, the content scripts and the, uh, the web page. So the web page can't access any of the privileged APIs that the content script that's running on the same page uses. So. Uh, this is a very, very well thought out API. It's originally from Chrome, and it's based on academic, academic research done by uh, some of the members of the Chrome team. And it's, it's really, really, really well th thought out. So I'm, think, I'm thinking we're going to the right direction. It's, it's getting more secure rather than the opposite. Anyone else? If no more questions, I thank you and <laughs> bye.